coming up. Initiative. Ooh, I love it. All right. Initiative. I become the guru of gusto and activate a hidden boost of initiative to help rocket. To preface that's one of the things, someone just sent me an article, which I thought was really interesting from um, from a magazine called SciTech Daily. And what they've been doing, they've been doing research and studies, and they found that actually the shape of your brain, so there are 12 cranial nerves, three of them, the glossopharyngeal, spinal accessory, and the vagus, vagus exit from this area right here, right in the back between this purple and orange bone. Yeah. So for me, personally, I, I don't know. I totally think that more motion is better. The nervous system develops. So the first year of life. So <laughs> ideally, if you if you can't open your mouth three quarters of the way with your tongue up there, that's a problem. So yeah. that's the first measurement. So if I have somebody, if I looked at you and you did that, I'd say, oh, that's great. want to invite you to the first annual Munch Bunch Wellness and Rejuvenation Retreat in the Dominican Republic, November 9th through the 12th, 2023. It will be an all-inclusive retreat meant to refuel you, give you a chance to rest, relax, and network with others in our Munch Bunch family. We will also be talking about ways to get out of your own way so you can live your dreams, build your business, and do what you need to do. So check it out. The link is in the description, and the dates are November 9th through the 12th. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Munch Bunch podcast. It's Kimi Nishimoto and Megan Van Noy. Hello, my girl. And today we have a new friend, Dr. Marty Rosen. He is a chiropractor. His practice is Wellesley Chiropractic Office. Um, he also teaches online and a hands-on program through the Peak Potential Institute. And he's going to talk to us today about cranial strains, cranial facial deformities, things like that. Um, so we will let him introduce himself in just a moment. But before we do, we're going to start with our positivity message for the week for Munchy Monday, our affirmator. And Dr. Rosen, you get to pick the card for the week. All right. It's very official. So what I'm going to do is I'm yes. going to base, I'm just going to shuffle okay. and then you're going to tell me when to stop. stop. Yes. Okay. So, all right. You ready? Ready to go. Yeah. Wait, hold on. My hands feel really small today. Okay. Ready, set, yep. go. Stop. All right. Top or bottom? Oh, let's do top. Initiative. Ooh, I love it. All right. Initiative. I become the guru of gusto and activate a hidden boost of initiative to help rocket my life into a previously unexplored direction. This could mean going on a far flung globe trotting adventure. Look at that. Oh, Kimmy. <laughs> or it could be as simple as picking up a hobby. Me. Uh, grabbing a volunteer gig or meeting some new cohorts. Either way, this fresh journey begins with one small step or one short text or Siri, what's my second career? So with that little penguin on a rocket huh? ship. But should I have a little rocket ship tack too? So there we go. That's perfect. <laughs> we always find a way to like bring things back around here. So I think that's great. That's awesome. <laughs> and then... um. You're also, you're based on the East Coast, right? In, yes, where outside of Boston. Awesome. Awesome. 14 miles on the um, Boston Marathon. Route. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. Claim to fame. You're on the route. You're on the route. <laughs> Have you ever I ran the marathon? No, I knew you were going to ask me that. No, I've never ran the marathon. Me neither. Me neither. I've done a half yeah. marathon through the wine country, and I don't know <laughs> if it was worth it, to be honest with you. So, no. <laughs> Have I ever told you my story of my half marathon? No, have I told you mine? Yeah. No, let's swap okay. let's swap stories real fast. So I have exercise induced asthma that only presents when I run. And so now I'm just like, I'm not gonna run anymore. Problem yeah. solved. But before that, I just had gotten an inhaler and I didn't know how to use it properly. So I kept hitting it and nothing was happening and my lungs were on fire. 
and I made it to the finish line and immediately passed out like a fireman had to come over and put me on oxygen. Turns out I never took the cap off the inhaler. Well, I'm at least impressed that you made it um, 13 miles without being able to breathe. So that's pretty good. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yes. Um, mine was my, this was 10 years ago, my best friend um, and I signed up for one because I was her maid of honor. And like, we were going to like sweating for the wedding, which is what you do like in your twenties, but not your thirties. Uh -huh. um, well, we, you know, for Kimmy's wedding, we margaritaed and we daiquiri'd and we, mm -hmm. <laughs> for her wedding I learned um so we thought because we're we were you know in our early 20s we had this idea of when we thought she was going to get married and like when her boyfriend was going to propose that we were being like proactive uh -huh. um so we thought she's gonna get married in October so like great we'll do something at the end of August um and so we ran that we got in shape all summer ran everything ran this half marathon they didn't end up getting married till February so what I did six months prior really was not helpful didn't for pay off no didn't pay off <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why do we do this again? And then my best friend has like bathroom anxiety. So anytime we like went by porta potty, she's like, I have to go. What if I can't go again? So <laughs> we took a lot that's, of breaks. So <laughs> that, that, that's a tough way to run a marathon, half marathon. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm good. I've done it. Yeah. I've, I've done it. I've got the medal. It's cool. That's all that counts. It's cool. <laughs> you can put it away in your little bucket list for later. That's right. That's right. That's, that's a fun fact about me. So oh, another fun fact about me is I love chiropractors. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that. I love chiropractors. I love, um, I've worked with, you know, several different types over the years of just learning new things and, you know, sure. learning more of what my body needs. So tell us more about the kind of chiropractic care that you sure. practice. So I graduated chiropractic school before both of you were born. I graduated in 1981. <laughs> um, and um, when we graduated, my wife also, I met in chiropractic school. My wife's also a chiropractor and she wrote the book with me. It's all in your head and runs peak potential with me. And um, when we graduated chiropractic school, we had a baby. And so one of the things we learned in chiropractic school is how important chiropractic care is to the developing brain and nervous system. One of the things we didn't learn in chiropractic school is how to take care of babies. Um, mm. It was kind of, back then, it was not really um, in the curriculum as much. So anyhow, I started, that's where I started my journey. So my chiropractic practice is a family oriented practice. I take care of three generations of people, um, infants, adults, grandparents, anything. We do specialize in pediatrics only because we feel that that's kind of the most important time for neurological development and brain development. So a large percentage of our practice are infants, children, teenagers, and then of course the families come in. I did do sports chiropractic for a while, but um, mainly that's not my passion and my love. So we're, I'm also a craniopath. And the importance around that is that we deal with cranial facial distortions, cranial traumas, um, neurodevelopmental issues and neurodevelopment diversity. So I specialize in cranial, in cranial adjusting. I teach cranial adjusting. I teach pediatrics, both my wife and I, through, as you said, the Peak Potential Institute. We spend many, many, many hours. We used to spend 20 to 28 weekends a year out on the road teaching. Now it's a lot less. Um, some of that had to do with COVID. Some of that has to do with tired of being on planes. And also um, Zoom. Zoom has been a great way to, to also teach. So, so if you walk into my practice, you'll see um, newborn babies. You'll see 80-year-old people. You'll see sometimes dogs, cats. Um, it, it's a plethora of people. And our goal is to help people improve the function of their nervous system throughout their lives. So it's a lifetime care. The technique I use, a short version is just called circle occipital technique. And what's great about the technique, it has a lot of parameters. So we can either treat people um, with very low force techniques and also some of the standard techniques that people see. So depending on your spine, your needs and your desires, we have techniques that can actually help you regardless of the type of care you're looking for or the condition of your spine. So that's the short version of who we are and what we do. And what is a cranial facial distortion? So to preface, that's one of the things, someone just sent me an article, which I thought was really interesting from, um, from a magazine called SciTech Daily. And what they've been doing is they've been doing research and studies, and they found that actually the shape of your brain is as important, if not more important, than the neurological connections that your brain makes on how it functions. So when we talk about cranial facial distortions, the gross 
um, distortion pattern would be, let's say a baby was born with vacuum delivery or forceps delivery, you could see a dent in their skull or a torsion in their skull. Um, C-section delivery is also a lot of, they, their heads look really good, but there's a lot of stress from the tractioning out from the mother's uterus. And so that can create distortion patterns, things like flagocephaly brachycephaly, flathead syndrome, you know, those are the kind of things we see. There's another thing called scaphalocephaly. So it's very common. You see little kids with, you know, wearing helmets. Those are cranial facial distortions. The other things that parents often see is like when my child opens their mouth, it deviates to one side or one eye looks smaller than the other or one ear looks flared out. Another big sign of cranial facial distortions is when a newborn likes to nurse, let's say more on one side than the other, because it's more comfortable for them to be able to suck on that side or something like torticollis when they have difficulty turning their head to one side and one side of the neck will be tighter and look more swollen or one side of the cranial will be flattened. So any type of time when you look at an infant or even an adult, but let's stay with the children, when you look at infant and their cranium, their face looks really twisted or distorted, or they have some functional incapacities. In other words, they have trouble nursing, and they have trouble sucking. They only sleep on one side. Um, they don't like tummy time. They have a hard time lifting their head. You know, they like to nurse on one side. All those kind of things that you see, even things like tongue tie can create faint cranial facial distortion because it affects the way the jaw functions. So that's a whole plethora of things that we look at when we evaluate it. And what people forget is that the cranium and the face are actually made up of separate bones. So we look at a skull and go, oh, it's a skull. But the cranium is actually made up of eight bones. The face is made up of 14 bones. So all these bones have joints. I actually brought a little friend here. Here's Show my us. little friend. Here's my little friend. So this is an infant skull. And you can see all these kind of spaces, all this soft tissue spaces, these fontanelles. And we all recognize these soft spots when we feel on a baby's head. The whole idea of this cranial structure with all these kind of sutures and soft spots is to allow the brain to grow 101% in the first year of life. So these sutures, which are what they're called, and these fontanelles, which are the open spaces, are designed to allow the cranium to expand. So if there's a distortion in the cranium, if the sutures overlap or the fontanelles close too early, they can affect how the underlying structure, which is the brain, will grow. And that, as we now are learning, is actually as important, if not more important, than the neurological connections that occur inside the brain. So that's what we're looking at. So cranial, cranial chiropractors, uh, what we do is we study and work and evaluate the function of the cranial sutures, just like you evaluate the motion of the spine. You know, can the person bend over? Can they lean back? Can they twist? Well, we also evaluate the motion in the cranium when the baby sucks because the palate itself is made up of four separate bones. So we evaluate that motion to make sure that the motion is normal, that the growth patterns can occur normally, and that the underlying structures, which happen to be the brain and the central nervous system, can function right. Mm, amazing. Can you show us the palate? Because over here at the Munch Bunch, we're obsessed with palates. <laughs> okay, well, this is the easiest way to do it. I'm going to take the adult skull, and you can look at it right here. So you're going to see the two green are the, what's called the maxilla, which are the same bones that make up the front of the face. And then the two orange bones back here are called the palatine bones. And they come up and they attach to this big yellow bone here called the sphenoid. And so the sphenoid, the palate, the sphenoid, the palatine, and the maxilla all affect the way the palate functions. And the sphenoid, if you see this area between the purple and yellow, this is a junction. It's called a synchondrosis joint. It's called the sphenobasal junction. And what makes that important is the first 26 years of life, it's very mobile and it moves. So that sphenobasal junction affects the entire cranial facial growth structure because this bone, this little yellow bone, the sphenoid, attaches or articulates to every single bone in the cranium, except mm -hmm. for these two little ones, the nasal and the lacrimal. So it affects the entire cranial growth patterns. Not only that, nine of the 12 cranial nerves are directly affected by the movement and the function of the sphenoid. So it has a global effect on the whole central nervous system, growth patterns, um, what we call movement of cerebral spinal fluid and tension in the system, which we can talk about later if you want the dural meningeal system. So as palate lovers, it is so important that this palate moves and grows properly because it affects the dynamics for the rest of the cranium. So when babies have tongue tie or babies have heightened gag reflexes or babies have problems sucking, that changes the formation of the palate. Part of the way the palate forms is by pressure of the tongue up against it and the ability for the baby to suck. So if they can only suck on one side, right, they can create a distortion in the palate. Mm. Um, if they can't get their tongue, one of the big things, I'll put the jaw back on on this guy. 
one of the big things that happens is if the tongue tie is too restricted, this jawbone can't move out far enough. And so what happens is you'll see a baby, like sometimes you'll see a baby when they start to get older and they try and nurse, they bite on the mother's nipple and the mother starts to complain of pain. It's because the baby can't pull their jaw out far enough to nurse quickly. So they have to compensate by trying to clamp onto the, onto the nipple. That's another sign of, of tongue tie. It may not show up in the first you know, two to three months because the baby's sucking reflexes are kind of weaker and they get stronger as the baby gets older. When they get too strong or strong enough and there's not normal function, that's when you start to see a breakdown in the system. It's kind of like you were talking about running, right? When you run a half marathon, you know, at a certain point, if you're not training, your system tries to break down. In your case, you passed out. <laughs> but the bottom line is, if you're functioning at a lower capacity level and have to work twice as hard to do the same thing, that's going to affect the baby's ability to nurse, to feed, their 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 irritability. It's going to make it uncomfortable for them, for the mom. And, you know, you have a baby that doesn't sleep, and then you have a mom that doesn't sleep, then you have a dad that doesn't sleep, then you have a sister and a brother that doesn't sleep, and then you have a family that is under a lot of stress. So this whole, that's why I spend so much time, you know, educating the whole family about care, because it's not like people don't live in isolation. If you have a baby that's really distressed, it's going to affect the whole family. If you have a mother that's really distressed, it's going to affect the whole family. If you have a father that's really distressed, not so much. No, sorry. <laughs> that's not true but if you're seriously so that's why we talk so much about the palate the sphenoid basal junction and the the fact that cranial facial distortions are not only aesthetic in nature but they're also functional they affect the underlying structures and that's kind of what is people forget you know if you look at somebody and say well that face looks really distorted well it's like if you look at somebody with a spine and you see a scoliosis a curvature in the spine we look and go wow look at that guy's spine or that person's spine and we realize that not only does it look painful but it actually affects the way they function no different from that of the cranium the cranial bones hmm Almost like a scoliosis of the face and, yeah, and the head can, bones, right? That's that's a great, that's really great. Well, when we talk about sphenoid basal, you know, torsion patterns, it is. It's like a scoliosis of the cranium. I'm going to steal mm. that from you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I have scoliosis, so I know about scoliosis. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> it's actually very common. People with scoliosis um, have asthma. And have you ever seen a chiropractor? Well, but if you have never seen a chiropractor, that can sometimes help you, especially with exercise-induced asthma. I love chiropractor. Oh, it, it helps me so much. Yeah, awesome. I love it. Okay. Um, curious here. Um, when you said that it affects the cranial nerves, can you talk a little bit about the cranial nerves and what sure. they do? So there are 12 cranial nerves. Three of them, the glossopharyngeal, spinal accessory, and the vagus, vagus exit from this area right here, right in the back between this purple and orange bone, an area called the jugular foramen. So the spinal accessory nerve innervates this muscle called the trapezius muscle. So very common if you see babies with torticollis, that can be because of the spinal accessory nerve. The vagus nerve, I'm sure you've all heard about the vagus nerve, and it does everything from balancing the autonomic nervous system, which is a sympathetic and parasympathetic, affects digestion, affects emotional stress and level. So the vagus nerve is like the longest nerve in the body, and it has a global effect on digestive functions, heart rate, emotional regulation, sympathetic and parasympathetic patterns. So it is when that nerve gets involved, that creates a whole plethora of symptoms. The other cranial nerves, eight of, I'm oh, sorry, six of them go directly through this bone called the sphenoid. So if you know about a spine, it has one bone on top of each other and there's little holes called the foramina where the nerves come out of. In the cranium, six of the cranial nerves go directly through the sphenoid. A lot of them innervate the eyes, all right. And so a lot of them innervate the, the muscles of the face, um, hearing, balance. So all the cranial nerves affect the function of your cranium, how your jaw moves, how your face opens, how your eyes track, um, your vision. You know, the optic nerve is in the base of the cranium and goes all the way through, controls how you are able to see. Um, you have nerves that control how you hear, cranial nerves. Also your balance, you know, how you see yourself in space, how you can stand, how you balance. They also can affect some of your coordination. So all the cranial nerves, they, many of them start from the base of the brainstem, come up all the way to the entire face. Six of them go through the sphenoid. Um, three of them come out of the jugular foramen and innervate uh, a lot of functions in the digestive system, sympathetic nervous system, 
uh, muscles of the upper neck muscles of the trapezius, the shoulder muscle. And then another three of them don't go all the way through, but they affect things like hearing and balance um, also. So anything that happens um, to you to process information, to see, to smell all of your senses, those are all affected by the cranial nerves. Mm. So know they cool. do so much and I feel like we don't know enough about them. Mm-hmm. Or it's like yeah. always a little bit of some sort of mystery. Yeah. You know, in like when we're talking about primitive reflexes and integrating cranial right. nerves. And like right. it always feels like it's a little bit of a mystery that we can never quite put our fingers on. And we're always well, asking people about yeah. it. <laughs> well, so, well, so the thing about the cranial nerves, and you have to think about it. So your body has a certain puts a certain amount of energy to function, like just to stand up, to walk, to talk, whatever it is, a certain amount of energy allotted to that. And then whatever extra energy you have are for like higher level functions. But if your body is pulling those low level functions are pulling more energy than it needs, then you have less availability for higher level functions. So talking about primal reflexes, for example, which is a good example of that. Primal reflexes are fight or flight responses. They are to save your life, basically, as an infant. By age two, all the primal reflexes are supposed to be gone. But if there is a problem, if there's a problem in the cranium and those primal reflexes are being affected by neurological input or what we call aberrant abnormal neurological input, and they're still firing off when you're six, seven, eight, or an adult, you still have these primal reflexes, you become reactive as opposed to be able to think of thought process. So you have trouble processing information. You're hypersensitive to noise, hypersensitive to sound, you know, all these neurodiversity type of issues that we talk about, whether it be on the autism spectrum or Asperger's or, um, you know, developmental processing issues a lot of them have to do also with the fact that the primal reflexes haven't kicked in and the child can't process this information and primal reflexes work by going from the what you just said the base of the brain stem and then we work our way through different levels of the brain function we start at the base of the brain stem then we start at the midbrain from the emotional level and then we come to our prefrontal cortex which is the area that we make cognitive decisions if there's a glitch in that system and we can't get into that prefrontal cortex well enough then we can't make cognitive decisions And we constantly work from like a fear-based or emotional response level. And that often in in environments becomes aberrant behavior patterns. So that is all affected not only by the cranial nerves, but also, of course, everything that else happens to the central nervous system. You know, this area of the base of the brainstem back here, the cerebellum is what it's called. It's that that brainstem. That is your main processing center. And again, we talk about craniofacial distortions, for example, brachiocephaly, which is the whole flattening of this back part of the head. This cerebellum has to grow 240% in the first year of life. So think about that. It's your mainframe computer. If there's damage back here, if there's compression, when you look at a flathead or flagiocephaly head torsion and the cerebellum gets affected, it's like the mainframe computer in your office that doesn't work all your peripherals start to break down and all the peripherals are the rest of the central nervous system, the rest of the cranium. So yeah, it's extremely important that all this system integrates and it's pre-programmed into our nervous system. There's timing mechanisms. So there's um, primal reflexes and there's milestones and the milestones are the timing mechanisms that tell us when the nervous system is supposed to develop. And so it's supposed to follow in a specific pattern so that the nervous system can develop correctly and that we can process and function normally. So many truth bombs just dropping. I want to go back mm-hmm. to what you just said here. So the okay. brachiocephaly is like where the babies have that significant flattening in the very back of the right, head. Back of head, right. So and when this whole part is... had a flatten. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, no, right. That's what you're saying. You're right. So it's this whole part of the head will tend to flatten. The bone is called the occiput and it flattens the occiput and the prio. This area flattens and the head will then grow wider this way. So a brachiocephaly head will look very flat in the back and very wide in the back. Hmm. One of the ways to tell also is so ideally in the perfect world, which we all live in, um, you know, in the perfect world, the front part, if you measure this part of the skull, and you measure this part of the skull, this part of the skull should be only about 84% of this part of the skull. So there's a 16% wow. difference. So with brachiocephaly, you'll see a much larger back here. There'll be a much more significant variance between the front of the skull. With flagiocephaly, what you'll often see is a flat part here and a bulging part here. So it looks like a trapezoid. And the reason for that is because we're self you know, we constantly try and compensate. If there's pressure on this part of the head and the brain can't grow back here, what's it going to do? It's going to grow, continue to grow and it's going to force the growth pattern forward. 
So that's what causes the distortion. It's the underlying structure, the brain, that's creating a pathway so that it continue to grow. So if there's some restriction in this area of growth, which is what we look for in when we're looking at an evaluation of the cranium is movement of these sutures and proper growth. If there's a restriction, the brain's going to continue to grow and it's going to force the cranium to distort. And that's, we know that there's an underlying problem. Whenever the cranial distorts like that, we know there's an underlying problem that's causing that to happen. So not only is it, again, as I say, aesthetic, but it's also affecting the underlying tissues, which are the cranial nerves, the central nervous system, what the germ meningeal system, and the cerebral spinal fluid movement, which is the lymphatic system of the central nervous system. So crazy. I love it. I mean, <laughs> and I just feel like when we don't have enough of like a an understanding around all those things like again it's kind of we're talking about like how everything's connected right but like why is it connected that way so okay so we're talking about the back of the head right now if we come up to the front of the head right like so then we start talking about like sphenoid strains and right. kind of the moving forward so what causes the sphenoid strains so well again we want to introduce this thought for tots course a parent's guide for toddlers ages two to five for mini mayo we have Megan and Kimmy going over nasal hygiene, myofunctional exercises, breathing exercises, tongue tie healing protocols. And then we have Jenny June going over sleep hygiene and Kelsey Baker going over feeding therapy and body work. Uh, the course is 297 and the link will be in the description. I, I you know, I find more and more as I practice, my answer is I don't know um, because I don't know sometimes. So the main things that cause cranial distortions in the infant will be abnormal positions in the birth canal, which is why we find it so important for chiropractors to check mothers and make sure that the pelvic floor and the pelvic outlet and inlet is balanced. So abnormal position, um, you know, things like the cord being wrapped around the baby's neck, placenta previa, those things are affected. Um, the second thing is the birth process itself. So uh, if the birth process is a, an assisted birth process, for example, forceps or vacuum delivery, that puts an enormous strain on the cranium. The other thing is that going down the birth canal, part of the reason the cranium is like this in infants is that as the baby goes down the birth canal, the cranium is supposed to compress over itself. And then after the baby exits the birth canal, over the next seven to 10 days, the cranium re-expands. If going down the birth canal is either too fast or too slow. There's been a study done in 2015, actually an osteopathic study, that the speed of going down the birth canal also affects distortion patterns in the cranium. You go from 10 milliliters of mercury of pressure in the uterus to 100 millimeters of pressure as you're exiting a birth canal. So it's a tenfold increase as the baby exits the birth canal. And so what happens if there's a distortion, you've heard of, you know, mama's mothers are back labor. You know, there's a specific way that ideally the baby's supposed to come out. Any variance from that pattern or any variance, let's say a transition period that takes three hours, puts an abnormal stress on this cranium and that can create those sub what we call subluxation or distortion patterns. So again, the birth process is a big thing, staying in the uterus, it's, you know, the way the baby is in the uterus. And then the third thing, of course, is traumas as the baby comes out, right? If the baby, you know, babies fall, um, especially as we get older, they're learning to sit, crawl, and walk. So those can cause distortion. So there is physical trauma that, that causes those distortion. And then the last thing that we find is um, for a short class in what the German angel system is. If you think about this, if you think of a tube that attaches all the way down to your tailbone, to the tiniest little coccyx, it comes all the way up over the spinal cord, attaches into this hole here called the foramen magnum, comes up into the skull and then comes over the skull and attaches to these sutures. And there's a tube and then every single nerve that exits between the vertebrae has attached to the tube. That's called the dura. And it's a tension system. It's like a cord. And it's, its job is to do two things. One is to control the tension on the cranial bones and the, and the nerves. And the second thing it is, is to allow cerebral spinal fluid to flow up and down that tube. So if that tube gets twisted or torqued, um, either through falls, um, through the birth process, through the kind of trauma, as it attaches to the cranial bones, it can cause distortions in the growth patterns. Just like if I took your arm and twisted your arm and held you like this for six months, right? What would happen to your arm? You, you would get bone remodeling. So the dura, in the, especially in the infant, creates the ability of the cranium and the spinal bones to grow normally. So if that is too tight or too loose, that also affects that distortion pattern. So yeah, those are a lot of factors that create, you know, the sphenobasal distortion pattern, because again, 
spinal basal having that flexibility in that joint is the most mobile joint in the cranium. So that has a large impact on the dural tension, controlling it and also being affected by it. Mm, wow. What about container baby, which no judgment for us, like everybody, yeah, everybody mm. has to do what they can do. Taking care of babies mm. is really hard, but we do know that if babies are in containers too much, it can cause. Uh, so you're talking about swaddling. Is that basically swaddling, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. being in like car seats uh, for a long time, right. being in the swings for a long time versus the floor is yeah. more biological. Yeah. So for me personally, I, I don't know. I totally think that more motion is better. The nervous system develops. So the first year of life, you're developing connections in each nerve, anywhere from a thousand to a hundred thousand connections per nerve. So they make they make pathways. Well, the only way pathways are made is through stimulation. So the more stimulation, the more pathways are available. By the eighth month of life, you have you have peaked at your maximum what we call synaptic development. That's the fastest your body's ever going to make these connections. So if you limit input, whatever it is, motion input, sound input, call anything. If you input any of, through any of the senses, you decrease the amount of connections that the body makes. And as we get older, we tend to pair off the connections we don't lose. So we make more than we need. So as we go, older, we can get rid of the ones that we don't need. So if you don't have enough or a lot, that decreases the child's capacity. So in my world, if you have a container baby or a swaddle baby and that they can't move and they can't use that motion, they're going to create less neurological input. They're going to create less synapses and they're going to have a lower functional potential. That doesn't mean they're going to be completely damaged, but it's going to change their ability to the functional potential. It's going to decrease the number of synapses, which basically means it's going to decrease the number of pathways they have accessible to do activities, to process information and to function. So I personally feel unless there's a specific reason that that has to be done, um, I don't like baby bouncers to jumping up and down like that. That's not great for babies. It kind of gives them whiplashes every time they jump up and down. So yeah, mm -hmm. we all have to do certain things at certain periods of time, but babies that go from car seat to stroller to carry in car seat and never get to do tummy time, crawl on the floor. It's not a good thing. It also changes the function of their spine. You know, the spine develops each milestone is a developmental process in the spine. So when you lift your head up, it creates this first cervical curve. Then once you can lift your head up and you're strong enough, you start to sit up. And when you sit up, it, it strengthens the back muscles so that you can crawl. And then as you crawl, you start to get the curve in your lumbar spine or your low back so that you can stand up. So all these curves develop in the relationship to gravity. If you put somebody in a car seat all this time or in a stroller or a swing, whatever it is, you create what's called a C curve, which is not as functional. The spine is actually a series of S curves. It has a curve in the upper neck, the mid back, the low back, and the tailbone. And those curves allow the spine to work as a shock absorber. I thought I had a spine. I didn't, I left my spine upstairs. But anyhow, it works the spine as a shock absorber, as opposed to if you have a C curve, it just makes the spine collapse on itself. So developmentally, both structurally, neurologically speaking, and musculoskeletally speaking, all three things get affected by that kind of process. And in my world, you want your child to have as much capacity and much adaptability as possible because. If not, they're going to have a rough time as things go on. Hmm. It's so interesting. I'm like, just oh. almost like speechless was just like trying to understand it all too. And it just all makes sense, right? We always right. like make the joke. And like, I think honestly, every episode at this point, like the body is all connected. And <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is. I feel like you've been able to like so succinctly show right. us how from like right. brain to toes, which we love. Right. So. I love it. So tell us more, like, what is, you said you came out with a book. Oh, yes. So, uh, well, we have a, we have a number, I have a, a pediatric textbook for chiropractors called Pediatric Chiropractic Care. But during COVID, when we weren't able to travel as much as usual, uh, my wife and I decided to write a book. And it's called It's All in the Head. And the name of the book is called All in the Head. And it's about everything we just talked about. It's about how to determine cranial fail function, cranial facial distortions. It's about the development of the nervous system, dermatological system, and it's also for parents, healthcare practitioners, anybody who works with kids, not just for chiropractors, to help them recognize cranial facial distortions, what they affect, and gives them some options of what they can do once they see them in their child. Because one of the things that really breaks my heart, and this truly, truly, is I'll see a parent 
who knows there's something wrong and brings a child to the pediatrician and they can all oh, your child will be fine, your child will outgrow it. You know, I had one one story I just want to share. Um, happened about a year ago, this woman came to see me with her 11 year old child from California. She was visiting her mother and she was staying here for about two months and her child had some issues. And anyhow, she was in, living in California and she kept bringing the child since it was an infant to different docs saying there's something wrong, there's something wrong, there's something wrong. And by the time the child was 11, the child, you know, had some neurodiverse issues and was having trouble at school. Anyhow, her mother said, oh, I've heard about this chiropractor and long story short, she came in to see me and I evaluated the child and I sat down with her and I gave her, you know, what we call a report of finding. I said, well, this is what we found in your child. And you're right, there are some neurological challenges and some of them are related to when I gave her the plan and she just started crying you know she just started crying she goes I've been telling people this for the last 11 years of my child's life and no one has listened to me and that a lot you know you, not as bad in 11 years but two years three years because most of the time kids who have neurodevelopmental challenges aren't diagnosed till they're around three years of age and the reason for that is because the nervous system doesn't get stressed and the prefrontal cortex doesn't really kick in as much till around age three. And so if there's a glitch in the system when they get to that area where they have to use their prefrontal cortex. That's when the glitch shows up. But most parents, especially mothers of that another kid, know before the child's 18 months of age, usually before you have that there's something wrong. So the book is, the, is also designed to help parents support them and saying, yeah, you're seeing this. You're right. Here's where you can get help. So that's a big part of why we wrote the book. And that's you can awesome. get it. The website, you can get it. Is, it's all on the head.com. Makes it really easy. All one word. It's all on the head.com. And you all in the head book. Sorry. It's all in the head book.com. And you can get the book from there. Or you can get it on my website from drmartinrosen.com, either one. But it is out there. And you get it on Amazon, but buy it from us instead of Amazon. <laughs> Okay. That's fine. We'll just put we'll just put your link in. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put it in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I love it. Do you have any opinions on malocclusion? Like so when there's like a cross bite or oh, underbite yeah. in yeah. renal strain? Yeah, I have a lot of opinions around that, especially, you know, so you're dealing with airway function. You know, that's another big thing when you have TMJ or temporal mandibular joint or cross body, you're dealing with airway function affects the palate. So if you have babies, you know, you hear them snoring and they're not congested from their nose, that's an airway issue. What happens is when the, when the temporal mandibular joint isn't functioning normally and you relax, go back to sleep and it falls backwards. One of the things that happens, right, it falls backwards, it closes the pharynx. And the other thing that people don't realize is that when you're sleeping, so if you have a baby, let's say tongue tie, or a person, an adult, I see adults with when you're sleeping, your tongue is supposed to go up against the roof of your mouth and block, you actually blocks your mouth airway, so it opens the pharynx so you can breathe. So people who can't get their tongue up become mouth breathers because they actually don't block the airway, so their mouth falls open, and they just, and they start, and so snoring, that kind of thing. The other thing you'll see with kids and especially teenagers as, as they get older, they broxate, which means they start to clench and grind their teeth because there's so much distortion in the cranium. It's it's almost like they're trying to massage their cranium to relax the muscles. Bruxism is basically a form of the body trying to open up and relax those sutures. So yeah, cross bites, temporal mandibular joint disorder, um, drop palates, uneven palates, early fused palates, all that stuff has to be taken into account. In some cases, we can use interventions that are very, you know, that are very safe, not very safe, um, what, what I'm trying, simple interventions like, like chiropractic adjustments, myofunctional therapy. In some cases, though, you do need dental assistance, maybe to a palate spreader or an appliance. So you have to be able to go to somebody who can help evaluate that and determine, you know, we work with a dentist, all, a couple of dentists, but with kids who have tongue tie and we, we determine if they have a tongue tie and we'll watch the process. And if they're not able to adapt functionally normally, um, we may send them for a revision. If they are adapting normally and there are no other cranial facial distortions, we may choose to not send them for that revision. But And it works both ways. The dentists do the same thing. They may revise somebody's tongue tie or lip tie or buccal tie and find out that the functional capacity is still not there. So they'll send them to us. And I work with dentists also you know, for airway issues. So anytime, I mean, if you're looking at a distortion, the, the distortion has to be, you have to determine if the distortion affects function. So structure and function are usually completely interrelated, but you also have to weigh what the type of intervention is going to be. So for some cases, for example, let's say a posterior tongue tie, 
I don't tend to have them revised because sometimes I find that a posterior tongue tie revision actually causes more problems because the child then has to try and relearn to use the tongue or they can't. But an anterior tongue tie, I always send them because if the tongue tie is anterior and you can't get the tongue out, then they can't function. So, um, and the same thing with temporal mandibular joint disorders, cross bites, what you talked about, clicking, um, deviations, opening and closing, all that stuff has to be evaluated to determine well, how that function is affecting it, what kind of intervention is, is necessary and what level of intervention is necessary. And somebody has to be able to determine that, take the lead and follow through to also make sure that the event, intervention is doing the right thing. If I have a child that's you know putting braces or put a pallet spreader in, they still come in under care. And besides me adjusting their spine, I monitor the cranium and how the palate is changing or how the appliance is working. And if I find that that is causing a distortion, I will call the dentist and say, look, you know, this appliance is causing the jaw to deviate to the right um, when they're opening or whatever it is. And we can work together so that we make sure we're creating a balance in that structure. So, yeah. Interesting. So the posterior tongue tie is an interesting thing for us because we, a lot of times will yeah. recommend that. So do you mean before they have the space for it or in general? I in general, in general, I watch it. Posterior tongue ties for me is a watch. So anterior tongue tie for me is do it. You know, there's just no, there's no way it's around it. Right. When it starts to get to the posterior area, um, a lot of times we can actually see. So I look at a number of the things. I look at obviously the baby's ability to nurse and then the function of the jaw and the ability of the mandible to protrude and retrude and the ability of it to track when they open and close their mouth. If all those parameters are working normally and the baby's not having any issue, including neck and head problems, a lot of the times I won't recommend the posterior tongue tie because it's not always really a tongue tie. It's actually just the way the frenulum is attached because we all have certain variances. Um, so I look at that, I, I'm much more into function, but like I say, anything anterior, the mid middle of the tongue, most of the time, and especially anterior ones, they just, they can't function with normally. And so we look at that. Gotcha. But okay. I have That's seen, kind of yeah. in like in yeah. uh with babies more so than yeah oh yeah but yeah with adults is a whole different ball game with adults, okay. so you know i've yeah adults is a whole different ball game it's a whole different evaluation protocol yeah i've had adults i had a, a woman come in her mother who was in her 80s referred this her daughter who was in her 50s to me because she's had all kinds of tmj problems all kinds of issues and she came in and i did an evaluation i said did anybody ever tell you how to tongue tie and she said no and she said, that was the reason she had TMJ. She had been treated for TMJ for years and appliances and all that stuff. And she had a posterior tongue tie um, and she was 54 years old. And I recommend she got the same thing happened with a, uh, a kid who goes to one of the colleges. You know, he was 20 something years old. TMJ came to see me. I said, well, we'll help you with the TMJ, but you have a tongue tie. Um, so, yeah, so it's a whole different evaluation mm -hmm. protocol. I'm really focusing, trying to focus right now more on my practice on, on kids. And, mm -hmm. and getting to the point where they're not. Yeah. I mean, it's great to take care of people who have, you know, created adaptive patterns and are, pro you know, have problems now and use just a right. cute, but I'd much rather prevent the problem than fix a problem. That's my thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's the ideal, right? Is getting early intervention, prevention, all of those right. things, right? Our jobs right. are for, for later on when they didn't get caught and we get to undo the things that they did. But right. like technically our job shouldn't exist, right? Like right. technically, like we shouldn't have jobs or careers in this because it should have been caught before. And we all know that's just not the case with West, you know, with Western right. medicine or where things are at. So I'm well, we're all about we're, the we're trained, we're, trained, <laughs> we're trained that way. I mean, you know, it's like it's no right. it's no different when a you know a person comes into my office and they 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 come in because they have severe low back pain. And I said, What happened? They said, Oh, I was picking the grocery bag out of my car and my back went out. And I'm like, well, do you really think that grocery bag and that one time was the issue? Do you not realize that there was an underlying reason why that grocery bag, which was probably filled with, you know, didn't weigh that much, all of a sudden your back went out, as they call it? So, yeah, there, where we have to kind of unwind that process where we're dealing with. That's the other thing with adults and, or older, you know, even older kids and teenagers. The idea is to find, you know, you're starting from where they're at, but our ideal process is to unwind it and find out how it got there. Like mm -hmm. that's what we really want. That's what we do in chiropractic is basically peeling the layers of the onion off. Like, you know, this is what you brought into me, but we know that what underneath that is created. And so great, we'll help you through this acute phase, but now let's find out why this happened. So number one, it doesn't happen again. And number two, that other process doesn't continue to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. 
And you're right. Most of the traumas and it, and most of the traumas and most of the stuff we see usually happens in the first two years of life and then goes unnoticed. And then the baby or the child compensates for the rest of their life until something breaks and then they try and fix what's broken. Mm hmm. So true. I think that's the thing about the posterior ties is they often have a lot of compensations. They can move their tongue, but at a cost right. of pulling on the neck or the TJ. Right. Mm -hmm. right, right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, if you look at them in the, the anterior scalenes are all tight. That's what I'm, that's exactly what I'm talking about function. If you can have the child to, take their tongue out. So, you know, what I do, one of the things I do is I basically have them open their mouth as wide as they can, measure it, and take their tongue and place it against the roof of their mouth up against your first, and then close your mouth now, put your tongue against, close it, and now see how far you can open your mouth. You have to be able to, that's pretty good. So you're I right. had a tongue tie release, so. We okay. had our tongue tie okay. release. tongue cheaters. tie release. There you go. We're cheaters. So they, <laughs> We've got great range of motion now. <laughs> yeah, so ideally, if you, if you can't open your mouth three quarters of the way with your tongue up there, that's a problem. So yeah. that's the first measurement. So if I have somebody, if I looked at you and you did that, I'd say, oh, that's great. And then check other functions. I mean, I, obviously you had a release now, but if yeah. you did it and you fit all those parameters, I would not suggest a release. Um, but if you fit, if your parameters did not fall within that spectrum, then obviously we would have to do to suggest a release because you want to create normal function. Mm. It's so nice that yeah. there's providers out there, um, you know, not just in the dental field, but like the chiropractors right. that are able to look at this because sometimes right. that helps to come from different sources. Now, so before too. we wrap up here, yeah. um, I've always wanted to ask a chiropractor this question because okay. I'm always on the search for the perfect pillow. What uh -oh. is your oh, thought on yes. pillows? I'm going to disappoint you. There's no perfect pillow. And the you reason is because we're different. But here's the deal. If you sleep on your back, ideally, your pillow should be lower and have some support for the side of for your neck under here to keep a slight extension. Of course, people who sleep on their back with tongue tie can't do that. But right. you guys can probably do that. If you sleep on your side, you need a different type of pillow. You need a pillow to fill this space. So if you sleep on your side and this is how you're sleeping, you're using your hands to prop your head neutral. Your spine should be neutral when you sleep on your side. Mm -hmm. So side sleepers need a thicker pillow that supports the neck and head and keeps this space of the show. You don't want to be scrunched over. So you need a bigger pillow. The problem is if you start on your back and then roll up your side or your back and forth, then you need some kind of specialized pillow, which you see like pillows with a little, like one of the pillows that we have has a, has a hole cut out in the middle. So when you sleep on your back, your head fits in there and extends your neck. But when you sleep on your side, it has a fat piece. And as you roll on your side, it, it protects that. But there's a bunch of different pillows on the market um, that you can use. And the best thing to do is actually to try one and have, if you're gonna, if you're a side sleeper, basically lie on your side of your pillow, have a friend, a spouse, anybody stand behind you and make sure that your spine is straight. If your spine is straight, there's a good chance that that's the right pillow for you. Very few people sleep on their stomach, on their back all night. And if you sleep on your stomach, there's pretty much no hope for you because that's the worst way you can possibly sleep because mm -hmm. you end up twisting your neck, twisting your back, and there's just no pillow that, that works for that. If you are a stomach sleeper and can't break the habit, the only thing I can suggest is that take a pillow and put it under your stomach and chest so you don't flatten your body against it. So at least you raise your body slightly off the table so you don't twist your neck as much. That's about the best I can suggest for that. With like a body pillow or like a pregnancy a body type pillow. pillow right? Yeah, or even just like a regular to train pillow. You. Just, <laughs> yeah, well, right. I mean, so, you know what? So old time chiropractors, this is how they train people to not sleep on their stomach. They said to wear a pajama shirt or a shirt with a pocket in it. And then what you do with that is you sew a golf ball into the pocket. And so every time you lay over, you lie on a golf ball. And yeah, that was an old, kind of an old way to do it. But no, there you go. But if the you trick. sleep on a pillow, Right. But if you sleep on a pillow, it, well, all I'm saying is it might not retrain you, but it won't allow you to flatten your body. So it'll right. take some of the torsion out of your neck and at least protect some of that. But yeah, mm -hmm. so stomach sleeping is not good. Side and back, that's the best I can give you as far as, as pillows are concerned. And yeah. is side, so for those who do have smaller airways or, you know, like yeah. me, yes, technically I tongue tie release, but I have a tiny airway. Um, right. So side sleeping is the best for me. Otherwise I get upper air yes. syndrome. Oh no, um, yeah, you can't. As soon as your jaw comes back, you will mm -hmm. stop, you know, it'll cut off your pharynx and you won't be able to breathe as well. Yeah. So what, like, what does side sleeping, is that probably the 
best way? It does depend on what side you sleep on. No, it doesn't depend on what side you sleep on. I mean, obviously, if you're pregnant, that makes a difference. And people tell you not to sleep on your right side because it puts a lot of pressure on the liver. And it's one of the largest organs in there. That, and it cuts off what's called the portal circulation. So often with pregnant women, sleeping on their right side is not as comfortable. But as for mm -hmm. the rest of us, when we're not pregnant, um, whichever side is more comfortable is fine. Most people who are side sleepers often switch side to side. Um, so, and that's not a problem. Some movement during the night, actually not a problem to do. But again, the biggest thing about side sleeping is to make sure that your head is not torqued this way or torqued that way when you're sleeping. In other words, you want to keep your spine as straight as possible. Um, and you want to not compress your shoulders too much. Yeah, I definitely was the worst stomach sleeper. And yeah. that what really broke me of that habit was getting pregnant. <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. There you go. There you go. Well, it's <laughs> such a... It's a comfortable position. It's a protective position to be on your stomach. You know, mm -hmm. it's a guarding position. It's very, very comfortable as far as emotional safety is concerned. Mm -hmm. Physiologically, structurally, not so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We can thank Izzy Baby for helping me break yeah. that one. So. <laughs> so Some of us can't get pregnant, you know. I, you know, the, the old school trick that the old chiropractors do is tell you put a basketball under your stomach, oh, but then oh, you just basketball. pretend, just pretend uh, to be pregnant, right? Basketball. <laughs> I've never thought of the basketball. <laughs> a volleyball would work too, you know, just pretend. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I love it. Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to. I know I've always been on like the perfect like pillow quest and people yeah. patients ask me that all the time too. And I'm like, as far as I know, there isn't one. So no, there isn't, there's not a perfect pillow. It, we're different. We're all different. You know, it's. Mm -hmm. uh, I love it. I love it. Okay. So if people, we, we're going to link your book in and we talked okay. about that. If they want to, you gave us your website, where are you at on social media? I am all over Facebook. Um, we're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We're, I think maybe we'll get Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, really we got LinkedIn. So um, you can just Google, you know, use at Dr. Martin Rosen um, is a good handle to get me on Facebook. Because we have a bunch of different pages on Facebook because we have pages for our books. We have pages for our classes. So if you just, you know, look up Dr. Martin Rosen on Facebook, you'll get a link to all those pages. And um, like I said, at Dr. Martin Rosen is my other handles for you know, Twitter, Instagram, and then check us out on LinkedIn. We have a really big LinkedIn profile. We do a lot of work on that as well. Awesome. Perfect. And of course, you guys, you know, if you want to find us, um, you can find us at the Munch Bunch podcast. You can find me at NWMFT. You can find Kimmy at Mouth Muscle Memory. Mm -hmm. And you can find us in person in the Dominican Republic for our business and oh. burnout retreat yes dr marty you and your wife yeah, should when, come join us in the dominican republic november 9th through 12th oh all right I'm, we're gonna I'm gonna spend... look at the recording i'll talk to her yes we'll send you the link yeah we're gonna spend yeah, two and a half good. days dominican republic awesome. um, really taking care of our businesses and then also taking care of our bodies and our minds so you know That'll i think we fun. might have a job for you even <laughs> <laughs> If I go on vacation, I go on vacation. That's yes. all right. We won't. We won't yeah. misuse you. We won't misuse you. That's okay. <laughs> you can just come join the fun. So, uh, if you guys want links to that, you can find that uh, in our social medias, or you can directly message us. Uh, we do have just a couple spots left. So, we will catch you guys on the next Munchy Monday. We hope everybody has a great week. Bye. Thank you so much, guys. It was awesome Thank working you. with you. I really appreciate you having me on too. It was really a lot of fun. Thank yes. you. Thank you. We have a special offer for our Munch Bunch listeners. To book a virtual consult with Megan, she's offering a discount of $25 off. Just email her, Megan, at nwmyofunctionaltherapy.com or through her website, www.orofacial-myology.com. To book a virtual consult with Kimmy for the $25 off, email her mouthmusclememory at outlook.com or through the website www.mouthmusclememory.com. 